Okay, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order, please. It's the regular meeting of the City of Corville City Council on May 9th, 2017. Roll call. Councilmember Hoft. Present. Gross. Gill. Present. Dodds. Present. Goodrich. Here. Okay, um, uh, council members are all present except for <laughs> Councilmember Gross, who will be here. He's just running a little bit late, um, as is the City Administrator, City Attorney, and Deputy City Clerk, and several staff in the audience. <laughs> I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Nope. Moved and seconded. Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. okay, item four is citizen comments. This is the time on the agenda for anyone who would like to get up and speak to, to do so. And please sign in and give us your name and limit your comments to five minutes, please. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Martha Hampel, and I'm here on behalf of the ACLU of Iowa, Hawkeye Chapter, and Corville residents to introduce the ACLU's nine model state and local law enforcement policies and rules, particularly in regards to immigration. These nine policies and rules are what many in our community want to see implemented and followed by our city's officers and officials. I have a copy here um, that I'd like to submit as part of the minutes, if that's possible. Um, I first reached out to Police Chief Shane Crone by email on April 22nd and by phone, um, their phone messages on April 27th and May 4th. Uh, we did not receive a response from the chief regarding the nine policies and rules or whether he even received our communication. Um, I also have a copy of that email here that I'd like to submit as part of the minutes. Um, I sent an email to Mayor Lindell and City Council members only last Friday, May 5th, um, requesting consideration of ACLU's nine model state and local law enforcement policies and rules. So I realize you may not have had time to review that yet. Um, I have a copy of that email as well that I would like to submit as part of the minutes. Um, the end goal would be that the city of Coralville and police department would adopt the ACLU's nine model state and local law enforcement policies and rules as a city ordinance or a police policy, not only in practice, but established in writing as well. Um, the adoption of these policies would make Coralville, Iowa, one of what the ACLU designates as a freedom city. Um, I ask that the Coralville City Council and Police Chief Shane Crone re review the nine policies and consider adopting um, all nine of them. I also ask that the Coralville City Council and the Police Chief respond to the Hawkeye Chapter and Coralville residents as to whether or not the ACLU's nine model state and local law enforcement policies and rules will be adopted and implemented. Um, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. And it's, it's, it is true that we have not met or, dis, or discussed this since you sent the communication. So <clears throat> we will have, you know, we'll figure out a game plan and we'll get back to you. I promise we'll, you'll get a response. Fantastic. Thank you okay. so much. I just wanted to make sure that we came in person and yeah. um, submitted that. So Great. Um, is there someone that I submit these letters to? Yeah, the city clerk, you can give it to, to her. Right, right now, is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just launch ahead. Hi. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Ruggles. I'm on uh, one of the board members for the Coralville Community Food Pantry. And as we do every month, we like to come and share our latest numbers with you and upcoming fundraisers and activities that we have planned. Um, so for the month of April, we served almost 300 families, 298 families in the month of April alone, uh, as well as over 1,900 individual visits, um, which accounted for about 16,600 pounds of food that we gave to our neighbors in need in the month of April alone. Um, we are so appreciative of uh, the council, the mayor. So many people came out um, to our April fundraiser, the Music for Meals, and we so appreciate that. It was a fun night, uh, raised quite a bit of money. Uh, we'll, as you all know, we'll go for a great cause. Um, in June, we are having another community-wide free meal, and it's going to be um, at the Corville Public Library on June 9th and we will certainly provide more information to all of you in the community as well as we get closer to that. But those have been very successful for us in the past. We invite all of our neighbors in Corville to come and com you know, just commune with one another and have a lovely meal. So uh, we hope to see you all there as well. Um, and I did want to share one more thing, and that is around, around one of our nutrition initiatives that we are working on. Um, this year, as in past years, we provided a seed library so that our folks that come to the food pantry can take seeds of herbs and vegetables and grow them at home if they have the space or a pot to do that. So that's one of the things that we do relative to nutrition. So thank you so much again for your support. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the report. And it was a fabulous event two Thank Saturdays you. ago. So, Thank you so yeah. much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Very good. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the council tonight? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on. It's my pleasure to, uh, to issue a proclamation tonight in regards to Police Week and Peace Officer Memorial Day. Um, I'll put on my readers here. Proclamation, City of Coralville. Whereas, the Congress and the President of the United States has designated May 15th as Police Officers Memorial Day, and the week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week, and whereas the members of the Law Enforcement Agency of the City of Coralville play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Coralville, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems, duties, and responsibilities of their police department, and that members of our police department recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression and intimidation. And whereas the police department of the city of Coralville has grown to be a modern law enforcement agency which unceasingly provides a vital public service. Now therefore I, John A. Lundell, Mayor of the City of Coralville, Iowa, proclaim the week of May 14th to the 20th, 2017 as Police Week, and call upon all citizens of Coralville and upon all patriotic, civil, and educational organizations who observe with appropriate ceremonies in which all of our people may join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, sure, and in so doing have established for themselves an enviable and enduring reputation for the preserving the rights and security of all citizens. I further proclaim May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and call upon all citizens of Corville to observe this day in honor of those peace officers who through courageous deeds have lost their lives or become disabled in the performance of duty. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the city of Corville to be affixed. Signed this ninth day of May 2017, John A. Lundell, Mayor. I would invite the chief to come up and receive this. I don't see any photographers in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats, thank you for your service. Thank, thank you, Shane. Feel free to say a few words. Thank you. Continued support. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you, Shane. Okay. Thank you, Shane. Is that few enough, Mayor? <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say, I, I was going to make a com this comment during um, Mayor's time, but it, it seems to fit better now, and I just wanted to, it's, it's on a sad note, express our um, sadness at the loss of an officer this past mm -hmm. week in Corville. Um, canine officer Ivan, our first ever canine officer, lost his battle with cancer. 
and uh, and that was Wednesday. And so our thoughts go out to him, of course, but of course um, to his uh, officer, Chad Bender. Chad's been his uh, his owner and and leader, you know, his entire life, all the years of service. So um, that's very sad, but. Uh, we have uh, a plan in place to replace Ivan, and we'll, I don't know who he or she will be named, but we'll look forward to hearing more, but that's my thoughts. So. Great. Okay, now on the fiscal year budget amendments. Public hearing, uh, item six. This is a public hearing for the fiscal year 2017 budget amendment for revenues and expenditures. Council action on the fiscal year 2017 budget amendment will take place at our May 23rd um, council meeting. So I will open the public hearing. Are there any comments on the budget amendments? Any written comments? No written. Okay, I will close the public hearing. Item seven is the Iowa River Landing Retail Lease Agreement public hearing. This is a, a public hearing um, for a lease in our Iowa River Landing with a new business uh, called Marquee Pizza. And it's for uh, a lease in Office Building B in the Iowa River Landing. So um, item A is a public hearing on the intent to dispose of this property with, through this lease. Are there any comments? Written? No written. Okay. I will close the public hearing. And consider a resolution. A resolution approving the disposition of property and approving a lease agreement with River Landing Restaurant Company, LLC, introduced for adoption by Council Member Hof, seconded by. Second. Second by Gill. Discussion? Roll call? Gill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Hoft. Aye. Okay, resolution is approved all ayes with gross missing. Item eight is Coral Ridge Avenue Improvements Phase Two Duct Bank Project. That's duct with a T. Uh, first item is a public hearing on the plans and specifications. And City Engineer uh, Dan Holderness, do you want to? Well, I'll open a public hearing, then you can speak. So I'll open a public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this project is for the construction of a common underground duct bank along Corridge <laughs> Avenue from Oakdale Boulevard to Fair Green Road so that the private utilities can be relocated into that duct bank <coughs> and be uh, where they should be uh, for the future street improvements project, which will be bid later this year. Uh, the cost estimate for this project is $486,000, the majority of which will be recouped by the city from the private utility companies because they're gonna buy their ducts within the system. Uh, the project will be bid on uh, May 23rd and awarded at that council meeting that night and presuming good bids. Construction will begin in June and be completed by September 1st. Great, thanks Dan. Sounds like the ducks are in a row. <laughs> Any comments? Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Any comments during the public hearing? Sure. I have a question. Does that impede traffic at all? No. Thank you. Yeah. Any written comments? No written. Okay. Seeing and hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and consider a resolution. Resolution approving the plan specifications, estimate of cost, and form of contract, ordering bids, setting a date for the receiving of said bids, and directing posting of the bid letting, all for the Coral Ridge Avenue Improvements Phase Two Duck Bank Project. Introduced for adoption by Council Member Gill, seconded by. Second. Ooh, that was real close. Yeah. Seconded by Dodds. <laughs> Discussion? Roll call. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Hoft. Aye. Gill. Aye. Okay, resolution is approved all ayes with gross missing. Okay. Item nine is IRL Sanitary Sewer Project from East 2nd Avenue and East 7th Street. Also a public hearing on the plans and specs. I'll open the public hearing and stand. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, again. Uh, this project will construct sanitary sewer along, uh, as you had mentioned, East 2nd Street and East 7th, East 2nd Avenue and East 7th Street in anticipation of uh, future development in that area, particularly the arena and the uh, second uh, hospital facility. Um, the cost estimate for this project is $1.41 million. This project will be bid on May 16th, awarded at the uh, May 23rd council meeting. Uh, the uh, 7th Street section from 2nd to Quarry Road will be completed by June 30th. The second street section from 7th to 9th will be completed by the end of July. And the second street uh, section from the Latitude Project south to 1st Avenue will be completed by the end of August. Very good. Are there any comments from the public or the council about this? Any written? No written. Okay, I will close the public hearing and consider the resolution. 
Resolution approving the plan specifications, estimate of cost, and form of contract, ordering bids, setting a date for the receiving of said bids, and directing posting of the bid letting, all for the IRL Sanitary Sioux Project E, 2nd <coughs> Avenue, and East 7th Street. Uh, introduced for adoption by Councilmember Gill, seconded by. Second. Second by Hoped. Discussion. Roll call. Goodrich. Aye. Hoped. Aye. Gill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Resolutions approve all eyes with gross absent. Item 10 is First Avenue <coughs> Improvements Project from 6th Street to 9th Street. This is a, a resolution that's necessary to commence acquisition of property along First Avenue for this improvement project. Resolution authorizing the acquisition of property interests for the First Avenue Improvement Project, 6th Street to 9th Street, is introduced for adoption by Councilmember Dodd, seconded by. Second. Second by Hoft. Discussion? When will this take place then, Kelly? When, when are we? Uh, the actual the um, the bids will be this fall and work would start um, first thing in next next spring and the majority of the work would be done next year in Great. 2018. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Roll call. Hoped. All right. Gil. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Resolutions approved all eyes with gross absent. Item 11 is the Highway 6 and Jones Boulevard <coughs> traffic signal improvements. This is a, a resolution for engineering services with Shive Hattery for the installation of traffic signals at Highway 6 and Jones Boulevard, there by the Tyson's uh, uh, store. A resolution approving an engineering services agreement with HR Green Inc. for the Highway 6 and Jones Boulevard traffic signal improvements is introduced for adoption by Councilmember Goodrich, seconded by. Second. Second by Dodds. Discussion? Dan, do you want to give a schedule on this project as well? Yeah, um, we were, uh, had applied for grant funds to the DOT and were, and were awarded $184,000 from the DOT towards this project. That's the estimated cost of the equipment. So the city will have to pay the design cost, which this contract is tonight, as well as a balance of the installation, which will be about $144,000 we estimate. And so the uh, DOT funds will become available July 1st. So our goal is to get this designed and ready to bid in July. It's the uh, goal of getting it installed uh, late summer, early fall. Great, be a good improvement. Yeah. Any other comments? Roll call. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Hope. Aye. Gill. Aye. Resolutions approved all eyes with gross absent. Item 12 is indoor pool painting, and item A is a quotation report that Parks and Rec Director Sherry Proud will give us. I'm slow getting to my seat. That's okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we paint the indoor pool every five to six years, and this is this will be going on six years. We took bids. Um, in late April and possible painting and A1A sandblasting both submitted bids. Possible, possible, possible painting was the low bid at $36,103 and that is our recommendation to go with with possible. Um, the actual painting part of the project would occur between July 17th and August 18th. We will close the indoor pool July 8th we have some welding and repairs to take care of before we can turn the pool over for the painting project. And then we anticipate somewhere around the 26th to 28th of August um, when the pool's turned back uh, over to us, we get it cleaned up, filled, balanced, and we have some more work to do um, that will reopen. Um, during, that, during this time, we've been getting information out um, through the leisure line, through signs, through our um, email newsletter, and also um, a personal letter <coughs> to all of our um, pass holders regarding what will happen um, as far as if, they're, if they um, have a pass and need to extend that, and we'll be extending um, current pass holders by two months um, during that time. And that's all the information. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Consider the resolution. Resolution accepting quotation and awarding contract for the indoor pool painting project introduced for adoption by Council Member Hof, seconded by. Second. Seconded by Gill. Discussion? Roll call. Goodrich. Aye. Hoft. Aye. Gill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Resolution is approved all ayes with gross absent. Item 13 is Scanlon Farms. Uh, Southridge. This is a resolution for an agreement that outlines the responsibilities of both the developer and the city about the overall development of the property and the future terms of separate subdividers agreements for improvements in each subdivision. 
So, uh, Mayor, we would just ask that it uh, get tabled until a future meeting that oh. the school uh, agreement still hasn't been agreed to, so we need to get that done in conjunction with this. Okay. We'll table that until a future date. Hmm. That doesn't take yeah. action. Yeah, you should just have a motion. Make a motion. Okay. Make a motion to table. Second. Okay. Moved by Gil, second by Hope to table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion approved with gross absence. Item 14 is sanitary sewer rates. This is the first consideration of an ordinance that will um, effectively increase rates that will um, fund improvements to our uh, sewer treatment plant that should last for the next uh, 20 years in our community. And um, this rates, uh, I'll read them here, they'll go up. Um, the minimum charge will go up, this is starting July 1st, nine, from $9.85 to $11.15 per month. Uh, for zero to 200 cubic feet users, and from 318 to $3.60 per 100 cubic feet of additional usage. Um, and then again, there'll be a second increase next July, July of 18, for that minimum charge from 11.15 to 12.50 per month, and from 3.60 to $4 um, for a usage above the 200 uh, cubic feet minimum. Ordinance number 2017-1007, an ordinance amending chapter 107 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Coralville 2011 as previously amended by changing sanitary sewer rates. That ordinance is introduced for first adoption, first consideration by Council Member Gill, seconded by. Second. Second by Goodrich. Discussion. <coughs> Roll call. Hoped. Aye. Gill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. First consideration passes all eyes with gross absent. Item 15 is bonds, and this is a resolution to fix the date of a public hearing <clears throat> for May 23rd, 2017 for a refinancing of nearly $37 million in bonds. This is just a refinancing, there's no new debt. It's to capture um, better interest rates and restructure the, the loan payoff uh, time period. Resolution uh, to fix a date for a public hearing on not to exceed $37 million general obligation essential corporate purpose refunding loan agreements and approve the use of an official statement introduced for adoption by Council Member Dodds, seconded by. Second. Second by Hope. Discussion? Roll call. Kill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Hope. Aye. Uh, resolution passes all eyes with gross absent. Okay. Um, Item 16 is a presentation of the Johnson County Access Center presentation. And, uh, hi. Jessica is here with the Johnson County Sheriff's Department to... Oh, I come deep. We got a lot of folks here. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. She's, uh, while you're setting it up, um, I'll just, oh, maybe the, I'm stealing your thunder perhaps, but you have made this presentation to... Uh, the other cities in the metropolitan area, and, and now yep. we're the swan song. So. That's right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Um, as the mayor is mentioning, we've uh, talked to the Johnson County Board of Supervisors. We've been to Iowa City City Council, um, North Liberty City Council. We're on the agenda for University Heights. We've been to Solon City Council, and so now we're here with you. And I do have some members in the audience. Please raise your hand if you're in the Access Center Steering Committee. Uh, we have several people, as you can see, listed here. Uh, this project is really a, it takes a village. We have a lot of cross um, system representation. We have crisis services, hospitals, law enforcement, um, many providers and elected officials participate in the planning of this. So the purpose of, t of our time today is to share the concept with you uh, and update you on what we're working on locally and get your give you enough information to be able to provide general feedback on the concept and also um, start to discuss some of the financial contributions and uh, layouts that we're, we're seeking with the partnerships around the Johnson County area. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Dr. Michael Flom. He's going to talk with you all about sort of the concept of the steering or of the access center. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. I think some of you are pretty familiar. How many of you have actually been to San Antonio? So you guys are pretty well versed in, in the issues. For the rest of you, so forgive me because it's going to be a little bit redundant for the two of you, but I, I don't know how familiar with the, you guys are with, with this concept. Or So 
Basically, I'm a psychiatrist. I've been working at the University of Iowa for almost 30 years now in a wide variety of capacities. And I also, um, for about 15 years, about half my salary support came from the State Department of Mental Health to do sort of an academic public liaison function to kind of look at the publicly funded mental health system in Iowa and see what resources the university could bring to those. So I've had the opportunity to kind of go around the state and understand, you know, what kinds of issues there really are. And um, one of the things that's very clear is that our, um, our ability to deal effectively with behavioral health crises, crises whether they're substance-induced crises or a suicide uh, intention or threat or someone who's very agitated for who knows what reason, we don't do a very good job with that, uh, not only here locally but around the state. And what we do is essentially we've taught ourselves that if this thing happens, bring someone either to one of two places. If someone is agitated or intoxicated and causing a ruckus, they come either to a hospital, emergency room, or they may go into the criminal justice system. The, the, the secret is most people think that when they get to the emergency room, we actually know what to do with them. Um, it's a lousy place. It's a great place. I always tell someone, you have chest pain, go to the ER. Think you might have a stroke, go to the ER. You've been in a car accident, you want to get checked out, ER. You're in a behavioral health crisis, ER is a terrible place to go. It takes a long time to get seen. Uh, there's very few resources. And essentially, what, what it turns out to be is a choice. Do I need to admit this patient, or can I send them back to where they came from? That's it, pretty much. Now, if they were doing okay where they came from, they probably wouldn't have shown up in the first place, so most of them get admitted, okay? And we have very few connections to other resources within the community. Next slide. So you're probably aware that there's lots of concerns about the closure of the mental health institutes, and uh, I don't know if you're aware of the shortage in psychiatric beds, but it is extreme. And it is commonplace that there's no beds available, not only here in the local area, but often around the state. So patients are sitting in emergency rooms untreated, often for up to days at a time. And people always say, well, we need more psychiatric beds. I actually don't think we do. Um, I, I, don't, I am not sorry the state hospitals are closing. Uh, and I'm not a proponent for building more psychiatric beds. Um, <clears throat> what I am a proponent for is looking at the array of services and saying, are the people that we're really admitting to these psychiatric beds actually in need of those? The, at, the modal length of stay across all of the psychiatric beds in our hospital, everybody talks about average length of stay in healthcare. The modal, the most common length of stay is two days followed by one day. These are people who are in trouble who it looks like something's got to happen, I can't go back there, something bad's going to happen. They admit them to a hospital, the next day the sun comes up, they sober up, it looks a little differently, and they're ready to go someplace else. Putting them in a hospital is not the answer. I should say for what I think is a majority, there are certain people who certainly a hospital is the best place for them to be. Unfortunately, they often can't get in because there aren't any beds, okay? So, and, 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 and it, it, those are the people with serious mental illness who need to be in the hospital. The ones we see in the ER and in crisis, they're often people who have a wide variety of problems, substance abuse, complex trauma, they're homeless, they're jobless, they, they have criminal justice issues, next slide. And life is hard for all of us, for those of us, of us who have the, all the advantages. And when you hit the wall, uh, we've taught you somehow to go to the emergency room. And you know, I say when you go to Midas, you get a muffler. You go to the emergency room, we put you in the hospital. So we started about seven years ago uh, trying to look at alternatives to this. Uh, the we is the Johnson County System of Care group that gets together. 
And <clears throat> we uh, started thinking about, wouldn't it be great if we had some other um, place um, where we could uh, hook people up to a variety of services, one of which might be a psychiatric hospitalization, but a wide variety of other services. And over time, that uh, sort of model, next slide, just kind of evolved, uh, and we started kind of filling in different pieces of the model that we thought made sense, and we tried to envision where that might happen, and it could have even happened at the University of Iowa in the emergency room as a separate place. I think getting it out of a hospital is the best way to go. The next thing we did is we started making these trips, and some of you went to San Antonio, that, which is, uh, has uh, had a very successful program where they've been able to divert uh, people in behavioral health crises and people who are homeless, and they've done really a tremendous job. It's not the only model. Uh, there are models springing up all over the country, non-hospital-based models for this. We visited, uh, as a group, two other sites that had very different programs that I won't go into. <coughs> Next. And after really working on this for a number of years and getting input from a variety of people, we are currently at a point where um, we have a pretty good sense of what would make sense in our community. And um, without going into tremendous detail, um, what you're seeing in this slide is the vision of a campus that would not be hospital-based, um, that would have probably sort of two main entrances. One entrance would be a low barrier shelter. How many of you know what I mean by that? Not, not everybody. If you, I don't know if you know, but um, if you go to the shelter, you can't be intoxicated, right? So there are a lot of people who have substance use issues who are homeless and um, they can't get into shelters. Three months a year over the last couple of years, um, we've had a winter shelter that has been a low barrier shelter, i.e. you can't come in raving drunk, but nobody's going to um, check, make you blow. And this is the model that's springing up in lots of places. So in San Antonio, as you remember, for that big open space, remember that <laughs> big open space? You check your drugs and your weapons at the door, and nobody else asks you any question. I think you get your weapons back when you leave, but it's a place to go. So this would be a low barrier shelter, which would add significantly to our uh, local shelter capacity. The other door, would essentially be a treatment door. And everybody in the low barrier shelter who's identified as potentially being in behavioral health crisis would be invited to these other services, but they wouldn't have to partake. The other services include basically four different components. One is basically a place to sober up. Go over there, we'll talk to you in a couple of hours, we'll take your vital signs every now and then, we'll see what emerges. Once they sober up, they may need detox. That's a very different level of service. We have a shortage of detox in our area. This would have detox capacity right there. They also, um, people may not have substance use issues. They may just be in crisis. And we, this is the 23 to 46 hour observation beds. These are those people who are coming into the hospital for one and two days. We would do it right there and we would basically be able to start treatment right there. We would be able to hook them up with services that they need right there. Um, so we'd have about 10 of those beds, about 10 sobering unit beds, and five to 10 detox beds. Uh, most importantly, we'd have case management capacity to help get these people on and hook them to the appropriate services they need to take the next steps. Next. So we would be hopefully diverting unnecessary hospitalizations, and more important than that, we would be uh, giving people the services that they need in a non-hospital-based setting, connecting people to ongoing supports such as housing, 
job support, substance abuse services, and general medical services. Next. So I think that we are interested in <coughs> trying to uh, do some common sense approaches that are working elsewhere. Um, we live in an era where we have decided to medicalize all kinds of things that shouldn't be medicalized, at least in my opinion. We need to medicalize what makes sense to medicalize, use hospital-based resources appropriately, free up hospital-based resources when they are needed. Uh, we need to get people housed. Uh, whether they're sober or not. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be doctors doing all this work. And it doesn't have to be nurses and it doesn't have to be people at hospitals. This work can be done by a wide variety of people helping other people. So that's the background for this model. Um, and I think, what's, what's next, Jessica? Is somebody gonna? I will say that there's a little bit of redundancy in this slide, so you may be able to go through it. And will we just save questions for afterward? Is that, that the way you want to do it? Yep. That's the background, and this is going to be some of the nitty gritty. Okay? So, my name is Lance Clemson. I'm currently with the emergency department at the University of Iowa. I've spent all of my uh, professional career working in the mental health field. I, previously was the director of the outpatient services at the, the university hospital. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the details of the proposal, some of the costs, some of the budgets that we put together, and uh, probably more importantly, why we're here in terms of the ask, what we're seeking from you guys. Um, I would like to back up, though, and mention one thing about that sobering up unit. Um, one of the reasons where that becomes critical is that we see this as a public safety law enforcement relationship option. Um, if you're currently a Coralville police officer and you pick up somebody in the community, your option is either to take them to jail or the ER. If you go to the ER, the likelihood is, is you're gonna be spending hours, hours sitting with that particular patient, monitoring, watching, observing. The sobering up unit through the access center that we're proposing would be a 10-minute drop-off for that police officer so that we take over the responsibility for that particular person who's been picked up and we get law enforcement back out doing what law enforcement is supposed to do, out on the streets providing public safety. And part of our pop, uh, partnership has been law enforcement from around uh, the community, around the area. I don't know what the longest period of time is for the Coralville police officers being in the ER, but we've had people literally in there for up to two days um, from other parts of the state where it literally takes them off the streets. Now, having said that, we're looking at two different phases. The first phase provides basically fairly minimal medical care kind of first aid, if you will. So people who come in who need a couple of sutures, who need some very quick, simple medical care, we wanna be able to do that so that we don't have to go back and forth between the ER. Our vision is that eventually we would be able to provide a fair degree of primary care out of this location for this population. There's lots of literature out there uh, that speaks to the chronic kind of health conditions that just exacerbate all of these kinds of conditions for these folks. Going to jump ahead. This is what we're looking at in terms of the staffing. The staffing would be 24-7. It would be a mixture of a variety of different mental health professionals um, supervised by both the university ER as well as a medical director. Let me jump ahead. This is what we put together in terms of our budget. And our budget is based upon a number of different things here. And you can see um, at this point, what we're looking at in terms of the patient revenue, um, we are currently in conversations with the three MCOs, the current Medicaid uh, MCOs for the state of Iowa with Wellmark. We're discussing with them about how logical and how much sense this makes. So our projected revenue is based upon some of the contributions that the city of Coralville has made for the winter low barrier shelter as much as what we're projecting to be able to receive from these third party payers. A lot of our responsibility is the operating expenses of the human resources. 
And we've got that built right now where it's fairly robust. We believe that with uh, contributions and some creative sharing that we can bring down that cost significantly. Significantly so that we get to the point of where we start where we will be basically not starting at a loss, that we will be breaking even. And some of those creative solutions are, for instance, having law enforcement, the various different jurisdictions, share the responsibility for the security. So one week, it might be the Johnson County Sheriff who provides the uh, sheriff security oversight. The next week, it might be Iowa City. Next week, it might be North Liberty, Coralville, so on and so forth. If we can start bringing down the HR cost, we, we really can get this so that it's budget neutral. The same thing would be true in terms of some of the medical staff and some of the staff people who would be uh, providing the care. Um, we're, we're looking at our operating expenses, and if you want to jump ahead here, that takes into basically two things. One is our initial capital costs. We need to get this place. Um, we've got commitments both from Johnson County and Iowa City. Um, North Liberty is seriously considering this as well. Um, we're looking at basically two options. One is, is that we build it from scratch. We design the building or we would look at some facility that we could renovate. And there's pros and cons, obviously, with both of those. Um, and then the challenge becomes our ongoing operating expenses. And that's where we're looking at um, being able to bill and to utilize these services uh, that would be reimbursed um, from the various insurance entities. You want to jump ahead there, Jessica? Um, this is kind of what we've been speculating about. We've been working with Newman Munson. Um, they have been putting together some proposals looking at costing in terms of with whether we built it new or if we renovated a building. Um, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of six to seven million for the facility. What we're looking at is we're also uh, looked at kind of utilization. And we tried to break this down in terms of the populations, um, arrests by the various agencies, and ambulance transports. And you can see that the vast majority comes from the Iowa City, the Johnson County area. Um, but Coralville comes in at a very close second here, kind of very close with North Liberty. And in terms of utilization, what we're talking about is those arrests where the police officer is taking a person to the ER. Um, we're also looking at the ambulance transports and how often uh, ambulance service is being called out uh, and trying to streamline that significantly. You want to jump ahead there? We, we've tried to come up with a formula and there's no one size that is perfect to anybody. But we're looking at cap capital cost uh, contributions. We're looking at population. And we know that Johnson County, City of Iowa City, will be using it significantly more just based upon the data that we have. Coralville and North Liberty, you guys are about even, Stephen, in terms of the utilization. Um, and then we're looking at the other Johnson uh, uh, County cities, the much smaller ones, to have an even lower ratio. The formula that we came up with was so many dollars per person. Um, it was a little, slightly a little bit more towards Iowa City and Johnson County, slightly a little bit less um, towards uh, Coralville and North Liberty. And that's how we arrived at these numbers. Um, having said that, I guess I'd want to conclude with making one other statement. We criminalize a lot of things in our community. Um, we put a lot of people who have mental health conditions, substance abuse conditions, who are homeless in jail. We criminalize it. Um, that becomes something that is on a person's public record for literally the rest of their lives. Now, anybody can have a bad day. Anybody can have a crisis. There are some people who need to be in jail. There is no doubt about it. What they've done certainly fits that. That's not the folks that we're talking about. We're talking about people who experience overwhelming crises of various different kind of psychosocial kinds who currently either go to jail or to the ER. The record in the ER at the University of Iowa right now is seven days, literally waiting for a psychiatric bed to open up somewhere around the state. 
seven days. I find that obscene. We hospitalize far too many people because we don't have any other option than to put them in the hospital. This creates that third option. These programs are uh, popping up all over the country. The success has been phenomenal. The cost savings, the efficiency, the current literature estimates about 70% of people with behavioral health issues who present to ERs can be diverted to one of these programs, 70%. Dr. Flom and I debate often. We think it's maybe more like 50% uh, based upon our experience. Um, regardless, we're talking about truly changing people's lives, not having them sit for seven days, or being arrested repeatedly. So with that, we look uh, for questions. I do want to introduce some of the steering committee people that are here. This has truly been a collaborative effort, unlike any that I've been involved with. We have the Crisis Center, the Abbey Mental Health Center, Abbey Inc. from up in Cedar Rapids, which runs, uh, supervises Chatham Oaks, as well as some of the uh, crisis stabilization beds um, in the Crisis Center. So we've got a lot of people, and we're just a fraction of making that up. What we ask for you is, one, your conceptual support. Is this something that you can get behind? Two, we want somebody from Coralville to be a member of our steering committee. We need somebody to take part in that. Um, Iowa City has done that, Johnson County, North Liberty. We need somebody from Coralville to be sitting with us as well. We're gonna come back asking for very specific amounts of money, but we want you to be part of that process so that someone from the city can share that amongst uh, all of your other members. And we want your feedback and questions, so. And I would also add, you all have probably gotten, or at least, or maybe Kelly has gotten an email from the Johnson County Executive to invite um, some of your staff and city council members to participate on a committee with the other municipalities to give a serious look at um, the capital cost side of things. They're looking at potential properties to purchase, what the governance structure of this project would look like. <coughs> Might there be a 2080 for capital costs and 501c3 for operational, or might it be 2080 for all of it? Or I mean, there's so many options, and we really um, want that to be a collaborative conversation and decision between the municipalities and, and of course, the uh, steering committee is participating in that as well, so. What questions do you have? What reactions, what feedback do you have for us? Personally, I'm intrigued. I'm sorry if I can go first. It kind of hit me. Uh, 20 years ago, I was an uh, Iowa City police officer, and, and I remember my frustration level at having those limited choices. You either take them to jail. Well, if they didn't violate the law, what's your other option? Well, you can take them to the ER, and you could sit and wait, and you can remove yourself from the street exactly as you were talking about for potentially hours on end until they sober up or decide what to do. Um, and it doesn't sound like a whole lot has changed. No, uh, it's actually changed for the worse. Okay, and that, that's pretty disturbing, actually, because I remember how frustrated I was. That, you know, you really feel for some of these folks who are in that position, and there's, there, there's just nothing you can do for them. Um, when you're supposed to be helping people, you know, that's the, that's the goal. Uh, so I am intrigued by this uh, very much, and I would, from what I saw, I would like to know more, absolutely. Just want to, Lance threw out this 10-minute figure. One of the metrics that gets measured by these places is actually drop-off time. So that, that is a metric that is commonly measured and reported. Mm -hmm. And this 10-minute thing is, is a typical goal and, and is usually met. The, the reason why I said it's gotten worse is because of the state of the state right now. And if uh, there's lots of uncertainties, both at the Iowa level, at the federal level, um, unfortunately, what ends up happening almost always is mental health and substance use disorders fall to the bottom of the list. What we're trying to do is create a much more humane way of addressing these conditions and taking the stigma away from it. 
I would also just like to add, um, obviously Coralville has been very supportive of, you know that we've started a crisis intervention team training for law enforcement. So we have, we did our very first one in March and we had some of your officers, our instructors, and so thank you for supporting them and, and freeing up their time to participate in that. It's, it went really well. Uh, I will tell you in communities and what we've seen here locally is when you start training law enforcement in CIT and they say, okay, we get it. Somebody's in behavioral health crisis. Jail's not the place for them. We understand that, but divert to what? Where am I gonna take these people? That's on the national scene. That's what the technical assistance feedback we get is that you've got to provide the communities have to support the officers and what they're doing and trying to meet the needs of this population uh, and so this is what we're trying to do with this and and I will tell you the number of times the CIT officers call me and they've done phenomenal work like they've every option they've already tried like well there goes all my ideas like that's all I had and the number of times I thought if we had a if we had an access center that's exactly what this person needs right now um, and so we've done so much work from a jail diversion standpoint and ER diversion standpoint. We've done a lot of work on the post booking side and we've tried to do all things, but what we really need to focus our efforts on is the, the pre booking side of things we need to give. We need to have more crisis service options in our community. Uh, and so we really feel strongly that this is a model to do that. So we're just trying to figure out how to make it happen. And we welcome your input on that. Other questions, feedback, <coughs> reactions? I just had one, just a data question. Um, on your slide that talked about the percentage of ambulance uh, Do uh, transport, up, mm -hmm. uh, my, my question is pretty simple. Is that all transports or transports of patients that, of the clients that we're talking about? All, oh. all of them, I think. I don't think, it, I don't think at this point we could query that to that mm -hmm. level of specificity. Okay. <laughs> The, the data, unfortunately, is kind of all over the place. We're beginning to get it narrowed down, um, but this is all. Sure. And Jessica, will you make sure that we get, the council gets yeah. copies of your slides? You, it's yeah. saved on this computer, so Great. whoever Great. can <coughs> get Kelly them. Or the yep. clerk will make sure it gets distributed out. Thank you. It, it, looks, it looks great, but I'd like to see what the success rate is. I mean, this is a good, it's a good, it's a good you know, you have, nurses and that, but what, what is actually the success rate of the patients that go to this, this facility? Yeah. You know, what do you, what end, would you what's define the end as? game on this? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, we're not re in reinventing the wheel here. I'd like yeah. to see some facility that actually, you know, actually is achieving the goals. Yeah, the data is starting to get turned out, yeah. so there's some very some preliminary things, and we'd be happy to share that. Okay. Are there other areas I know San Antonio has been um, mentioned quite a few times. Are there other areas also? Yeah, they, these programs are kind of popping up all over the country right now. Um, what uh, we've been told and we've learned from experience, if you've seen one program, you've seen one program. They have similar philosophies. Um, uh, um, we mentioned Kansas City, okay. Miami, Phoenix, Tucson. Um, Michael can King you County, think? Seattle, Miami, Polk County, uh, Black Hawk County, and you know for local initiatives, they have versions of like right now we have mobile crisis outreach. We have some crisis stabilization beds in Coralville. Your officers are probably somewhat familiar with that. Um, we have two beds, so a lot of communities are starting to have pieces of it. Maybe not in this camp campus style model. I mean, what what Lance was just um, delineating are programs that actually have it all in one place. Uh, but the, the crisis literature out there is really saying this is kind of the gold standard, so we're seeing a lot of communities around the country providing this. And several national initiatives, National Association of Counties put, up the step, put out the Stepping Up Initiative to reduce the number of people with mental illness <coughs> in county jails. And so that has said a lot of people put a lot of attention on this. The White House last year put out the Data Driven Justice Initiative, and it outlined like eight innovative practices communities should have, one of which was CIT training for officers, another was a non-jail-based crisis stabilization center like this. So several communities around the country are signed on to both of those initiatives, which means these types of services and programs are popping up all over the country. But we can, I mean, it's a very fair question to yeah, say, what's the outcome? Where's yeah. the proof? And we'll get you that data. Yep. I've got three quick ones. One is on this chart, just so I'm clear. So of, the, of Iowa City, or of the University of Iowa, that's assumed in the Iowa City figures as well then? That's correct. Okay. But we wanted just to tease it out a Absolutely, little bit, right. but right. know that that's included in Iowa City. And then just from a detox standpoint, because obviously I, I agree with the sentiment that you know, beds and facilities uh, for those battling substance abuse, they're just not available to the extent that we need them. So if I, 
hypothetically, if I'm detoxing myself, would I be able to myself transport myself to this facility and just say, mm-hmm. I well, we hope this. you don't drive there, right. but yes, True. Right. you could, right. yes. So it's not a well, referral yeah, or do. anything no, like that. It's, so it's any, the, the, the referral process where people could access it on their own. And what we would really like to, from a public education standpoint, what we would really like the community to do is if you have a loved one or you're in crisis, rather than dialing 911, mm-hmm. you would go to the crisis center hotline or you would come here. So yes, anybody, loved ones could bring their family members, you could come yourself. Um, Law enforcement obviously could bring them. uh, Other emergency services, fire, EMS, the local law or emergency rooms. Uh, It's an, it's really, we really embrace that like all, no wrong door, like anybody could come in from however, walk, stumble, roll, however you get there. And when we say emergency rooms, know that Mercy in Iowa City and also the VA hospital are also involved in this project. Yep. And then last, the, the term medicalization got thrown out. I didn't say definition. What, what were some examples of where things are getting over medicalized? Or what, 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 I guess I'm trying to figure out what that means. Uh, Michael's going to roll his Ask eyes. Ask your doctor if Abilify is right for you. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the pendulum has just swung. Uh, people in my generation came into psychiatry uh, because we were not recognizing that uh, severe mental illnesses were brain diseases. Mm-hmm. And that's the flag that we carried. But we've gone so far that every, you know, the, the answer uh, is not, you know, when someone's life is falling apart because of real factors that are happening to them, and your answer is to put them in a hospital and start them on a medication, I think that's a real right. disservice. And that actually complicates the answer to your question. Yeah. Because when you say, what are the outcomes? We don't tend to measure outcomes by how many 20-year-old kids whose girlfriend broke up with them and they're heartbroken. Right. Are we not going to start on a medicine that may change, that they may need to take for the rest of their lives and we really don't know the long-term outcomes of starting people, which is common practice today? But that's for the delicate balances because I, you know, I work in the schools and the stigma of mental illness and depression have been so far removed that now kids are... You know, we, we've, we've polled kids, and, and the kids would rather have a school counselor, a real counselor or a psychologist on staff rather than an RN because now, you know, there's just zero stigma. Or it's just zero, but very little stigma of seeking mental health. And, and at the same point, I want to encourage kids to keep, you know, doing it. But I, I don't obviously disagree that the over-prescribing is there's yeah, a pill to and, fix and, everything. And we want people to seek help for behavioral disorders, but we just don't want a, one answer to every mm-hmm. problem. Yep. Well, conceptually, just, I absolutely yeah. support it, yeah. Yep. I'm just so impressed with your collaboration and um, all the working pieces and so on that you've already put together. And I think quality of care is optimal. I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, I have a few. Um, on the cost, when you had Coralville and North Liberty as $1 million, is that each or would total? You, total? Total. So 500000 a piece okay. is what we'd be yeah. asking or for. Whatever if you'd you like to give with, us more. Fight amongst yourselves. <laughs> In fact, if you want to write a check now, we'll gladly take it. Not a book at home. Do you want to go back to that slide? or No. Okay. No, I'm fine. Sure. Um, when we're looking at like the different areas, um, for beds and things, are those going to be rooms, or are they all together? Are you talking about in the facility itself? It's I'm going to be about a, more the detox. It's and going to be a combination. Okay. So there will be a, an area devoted to detox. There will be an area for that sobering up center area. That's going to be a very very special place. But it's going to be kind of like open like a ER with curtains type of thing versus. Room. Yes and no, um, and what we're looking at is kind of the best of the best. Um, we do want, and this is one of the arguments for building the facility, is that we want to be able to utilize our staff across all these different areas, as opposed to having one up here, one upstairs, something down in the basement. We will have a dedicated area for detox. There's special needs that have to take place with that. The same thing with the sobering up center. We also know that people who will be in our crisis observation beds are going to need a little bit more privacy. It'll be home e but not home-like. I mean, so that people can truly, given the environment, experience some psychological benefit to that. And I would just add, so with the sobering unit, because people are clearly very intoxicated, the model for that is that you have mattresses on the floor. Like, you mm-hmm. could not fall down, you're not gonna hurt yourself. So those are really mattresses, lots of plastic things, you can puke, whatever, and right. this is easy cleanup. So that's, so yes, the sobering unit would look like 10 beds in sort of an open space with an RN and uh, EMT or whoever on site. 
the detox would have, I think we're putting two beds in a room for detox, and then um, crisis observation, actually, the model for that is having recliner chairs, like the kind that you can actually lay down, because that's your 23-hour observation. And then with crisis stabilization, which I think I made a note to myself, got left off of our little picture up there, um, crisis stabilization is up to a five-day stay. So with those, you have your own bed in a bedroom, like a Jack and Jill bathroom, I think is what we're going for. Um, but those, and some of those, some of the outline of that is mandated by accreditation, licensure standards, sure. and those sorts of things JCOH. through the state. Is that? Joint commission, just like a hospital, would that well, it, Not that, similar to that, not the same accrediting body, but say, yeah, same okay. idea, that some of these, some of the services don't have accreditation standards or licensure standards, so then we just kind of go off of best practices around the country, but some of them do actually have code requirements that we have to follow. Okay. Um, since we're at a crisis for beds in this whole entire state, What's going to happen if somebody from Atumwa wants to come here? Or they already got their own down there. So yeah. not <laughs> no, but in but truth, you know, actually, somebody... they do have a home down there, uh, a crisis stabilization home that they can refer to. But that's a fair question. Yeah. And I mean, th there's a fear that if we build it, they will come. Yeah, they're already coming. They're already here. So um, our emphasis is going to be upon Johnson County residents, but we are not going to say no to people who arrive. Again, when we said earlier, kind of the idea of a, a no wrong door, we truly mean that. The, the people that we're serving, as Iowa, state of Iowa taxpayers, we're paying for them in the University of Iowa ER <coughs> at uncompensated care costs that are, you know, pretty astronomical. Um, and so I will also say some of the conversations, that, that conversations come up a lot. One of the things we point to is when we have the winter low barrier shelter, you know, you're not having folks migrate here to use that service. I also highlight the fact that, again, Polk County, Blackhawk County, Atum, what several of these counties around this, Iowa have versions of this. They have crisis stabilization beds or things like that. So, um, but it might be an issue. And I will tell you also, when we do CIT training with the law enforcement, we include our nine county mental health region. If you don't know, we're in this nine county region. So of course, officers from Dubuque and Lynn County and these are saying, we want this, we want to have, you know, so our, tr truly my hope is if we have this in Johnson County, it can serve as sort of a pilot for the other mental health regions and the other communities to say they can see what our outcomes are and they can sort of build their own. So it's, mm. you know, but, but you bring up a good point that we will probably have to navigate. So the number of beds that you have in all these different areas, is that based on probably space and money that you're thinking, or was that from some kind of data? I mean, is this going to be remotely close enough? or Well, and, and again, need? that's another good question. We're, we're basing that upon the number of behavioral health patients who present to the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, and then also allowing some room knowing that this will grow. Um, we're already, though, off the charts at the University Hospital and the ER from where we were last year. We're seeing a much larger volume of people, and what we're also seeing is the length of stay has almost doubled in two years. That's what I wondered. What would be the average length of stay? Do you have? In the Access Center or yes, the University the of access. Iowa? Yeah. Well, we hope quick. Uh -huh. I mean, this is designed as a brief service. We get back brief. to what Dr. Flom mentioned about the hospitalizations that are typically 24 or 48 hours. You'd be surprised what happens with the light of day. And if you have that community case management collaborative effort where we surround you basically with a number of problem-solving resources, things get better. Well, I think we can answer the question. I mean, so we will bill these services on, on a 23 or 48 hour payment, right? There's a, the, the expectation in the access center is one to two days. Where, what if you're not ready? Yeah, That's where the, the crisis brief. stabilization beds, there's okay. five crisis stabilization beds with an average length of stay of about five days. Sobering unit, we're talking about four to six hours. Detox, we're probably talking about several days. Yeah, three to five days, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, in, you know, you saw that you see the village we have here. You saw the Access Center Steering Committee, and Dr. Fom referenced the Johnson County System of Care. We have a group of stakeholders that have been the safety net. That we, that's the mission of the System of Care: is spread the safety net. So simultaneously, while we're developing this, this is if we look at it, our service delivery system as a spectrum. This crisis service is one piece of this. We also must continue to advocate for 
a, a, a comprehensive behavioral health system of care. So we serve on the advisory committee for the mental health region to say we need all these other services to be available so that when they come here, we can refer to supported community living services, psychiatric services, therapy, housing, employment, you know, and the idea is that we would, it would be a wraparound looking at all those psychosocial needs and make those referrals so that they're not cycling back through as quickly as well. So that helps with volume and length of stay as well. So who's gonna help us? Who from Coralville is going to serve on our committee? Maybe I should note that it's usually on Mondays around 10 o'clock is our meeting day, mm -hmm. every other week or so. Uh, Jessica, you're looking for two, two positions, right? One would be sort of the executive committee, if you want to call it that. Is that true? Right, so one would be the steering committee for this project specifically. The other representative, maybe the other representatives you're talking about is that the the elected official side of it, those who are gonna to come together to talk about the property and the governance structure. So we do sort of have two things like that, that piece I would say is probably a very time limited one, getting the electives together to make a decision about which property to purchase, how we would go about doing that, and then deciding on a governance structure, that's, that would be a finite uh, thing. I think the, the steering committee side of things is really programmatic ongoing. <coughs> uh, and so that might be a little bit longer of a commitment and a little bit more contextual than um, that other group, that other group will have a very finite task to accomplish. Um, this group is really sitting with us for a couple, almost, you know, an hour and a half every other Monday or so and walking through the various parts that it takes to make this happen. So, so you don't have to sign up right now. Yeah. However, we do have a deadline yeah. because we need Coralville to be involved. I think my name has already been put forward for the first one you described, but the second one, does that necessarily have to be an elected official or it could be a... Uh, well, what we hope is that it's somebody who could liaison with your council. So right now, the other ones, it is, you know, Terry Donahue, Lisa Green Douglas, and Susan Mims are the representatives for the others. And so, and the idea is that we come up with these things and we can guess at what the municipalities want and what the electeds will have an appetite for. But what we really like is somebody who could sure. sort of speak to that sure. and someone who then would liaison, go, okay, this is what we're kind of talking about. Go back to your council, be able to report back to us, like, are we on the right track? So I, I would say, either that or your city manager I don't know, or or your chief of police back there mm -hmm. no shame no uh, I mean really we'll take anyone who okay. would liaison effectively yep. I but I mean it sort okay. of made me make sense for it to be a city council member but we're not I picky I would be interested in helping out good thank you Laura wonderful okay. Yeah. okay great any other questions comments well thank you so much yep. thank, thank really, you thank you all thank for coming you. out thank you. you all do great work and yep. thank you yep. yeah. a, thank you Yes. It's, it's kind of exciting. I like it. Okay, back to our agenda. And um, item 17 is consider a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented or amended. Move to approve the can consent calendar items A through GG, inclusive. Second. Okay, moved by Gill, seconded by Gross. Any discussion? Roll call. Gross. Aye. Gill. Aye. Dodds. Aye. Goodrich. Aye. Hoved. Aye. It consent calendar is approved as presented. All ayes. City Administrator Report. Um, yes, I would just like to thank the staff and then mm -hmm. our residents that, re that participated in our many ways last weekend to recycle and reuse. And we had great um, participation in the garage shells and then here at the swap meet um, and the shred day, there was great participation in all of those activities. And Council Member Dodds didn't even buy a house this year. No. during that process <laughs> like she did last year. It's kind of a letdown, but we still <laughs> made a good call. <laughs> and um, just remind people that if your um, garbage day has not come yet, that this is Mayor's Cleanup Week, and so you can put your items out on the curb to um, participate in that as well. So mm -hmm. that's all I had. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Mayor's report, I don't have much others. Um, I do want to uh, say that we send our thoughts and best wishes out to the city clerk and his father who's having surgery this week, um, Thor. That's, um, so we're thinking of him. They're out in Colorado. And I just want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers this Sunday and, and congratulations for all the graduates that'll be graduating from the University of Iowa this week. City Attorney's report. I would share with you that I spent four hours in the doctor's office today doing allergy tests. Mm. Uh, 42 different injections and wasn't allergic to any. He had me roll up my left sleeve to 
make a shoulder injection and an immediate reaction, and I said, that's because you had me do the work of rolling the sleeve up, and I'm allergic <laughs> to work, <laughs> as Kevin knows. <laughs> Kevin. I have nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Committee and council members report. Uh, Bill, would you like to start? Councilman I hope. Um, I'd just uh, like to have a proud dad moment. Uh, my son, I told Jill, she was his daycare provider when he was uh, from that must have done six weeks. Yeah, <laughs> from six weeks until he was in uh, started kindergarten, and um, there were times when he had some rough goes and he acted out violently occasionally to some of the kids and he got himself in trouble. Well, he has channeled that violence now into a sport. And, tennis? Uh, just, tennis? Uh, yeah. No, not oh. tennis. Oh. <laughs> we don't want to give him a racket. Yeah, right. no, that, that would definitely be counterproductive. But he uh, he wrestled at the uh, the state uh, meet this weekend, and he was a state champion in both Roman Greco and freestyle, wow. and has qualified now for nationals in Fargo, North, North Dakota, in July. So congratulations to him. Yes. That's all I have. Okay. Well, Councilman Gross. Well, I made the the age old coaching mistake we were having a meet tonight and i texted kelly as we were up said i'll be here you know a few <laughs> minutes late should have <coughs> counted the chickens before they had to because we did that we lost that set and lost the second set and, and ended up winning a, in a third set super tiebreaker but it just uh what i thought was gonna be 10 minutes turned into about 35 minutes of d difficult to watch uh performances <laughs> but um the one thing i would say too i, I did get a couple uh emails on marriage cleanup do they go until the end of the day or if they if things aren't picked up on the designated day well sometimes they'll they won't get all the items picked up and if as long as it's an item that we pick up um they'll come back the next day okay there's several though instances where people put out tvs computers those right. kinds of things i had some emails at certain neighborhoods had, and this i checked this was like at six if their neighbors haven't been picked up, it's probably just that they didn't get through. That so they should leave their things outside and it'll get yeah. picked up at some point. Yeah. Great. And then we have a, li a library board tomorrow, so I'll, I'll report at the next council meeting what, what happens there. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Margell. Uh, I have nothing. Oh, I have, uh, I'd like to send out condolences to Barry and Roxy Bedford and their oh, okay. passing of his mother. Yeah. Oh. Councilor Dodds? I enjoyed the weekend. I participated in all of the events <laughs> <laughs> we could use another shred event soon because I can do more than two boxes um, and my condolences to Barry and his family and happy Mother's Day there you go. Councilman Goodrich I made a couple notes before our meeting that it is um, municipal city clerk week this oh. week so i want to congratulate kelly and also thank you and thor for mm -hmm. keeping all the <laughs> records and everything throughout the year and also just a shout out to for all the extra lifting and so on that our solid waste workers yeah. do this week we really <coughs> appreciate them thank you thank you good good points mayor can i add one thing sure that came to my mind just uh I want to throw this out. i'm not sure what the process is for establishing stop signs or where they should be but uh, i had somebody uh, tell me that I actually went kind of investigate behind 30 hop when you pull into the parking garage but if someone's coming from the north and if someone's going towards uh, the west there's no you know that there should maybe be a stop sign or just you know something from if you're coming from the north because there's nothing so two cars could just come right at the same moment do you know what I'm talking about yeah we'll look at it but you're always supposed to yield to the yield. Yeah, you're awesome. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of uncontrolled intersections in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but we'll look at it to see. Yeah, if yeah I think the, this one's exacerbated a little bit, but it's also hidden, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not wide open. I mean, so you can't see something that's coming either. Thanks. Okay. I entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. second. Moved by Gill, seconded by Dodds. All in favor say aye. 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 So Thank I'm you. In the end. Aye.